Good morning. How are you today? Well, Merry Christmas. I know Christmas is right around the corner. Glad that you're celebrating with us. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are in an Advent series. Advent is to prepare us for Christmas, kind of like four weeks out. So we've been looking at questions that you would want to ask and answer uh, going into this new year and really the new decade, right? A new decade, a decade of, of destiny, of really w- the decisions you make, the questions and how you answer them will determine a lot about your future. So we thought uh, going into this uh, Advent that we'd kind of look at some of the questions the people in the Bible that during the Christmas story, what they asked, how they answered it. So we started out looking at Mary. Mary asked the question, will I follow God's destiny for me? God had a big, a big assignment for her. She had to make the decision, am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? And you know, you'll have to do that, so will I. Going into this new decade, you have to answer the question, am I going to follow what God has for me or am I not going to do it? You get the choice. You can, I'm going to do my own thing. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to do God's thing. That's a question and an answer you get to, you get to answer. And then we looked at Joseph. Joseph, he, he was on the other side of that. You know, God had done something in Mary's life. Mary, that's his fiance. She goes, hey, I, I've never had sex with anybody, but I'm pregnant with God's son. And that didn't make a lot of sense to him. And that's another thing that we have to kind of wrestle with. This is, will you follow God when it doesn't make sense? Will you follow? And he had to wrestle with that. And then we looked at the shepherds last week. And they had to answer the question about, about finding joy and peace when Life is difficult. And again, how you answer that. So today we're going to be looking at the wise men. I love the wise men. They're kind of cool. You know, known as the magi. And they, they, have, they, they have to ask the question and answer it. What, what am I going to bring to God? What am I going to bring to Jesus? And certainly that's the question we want to talk about today. And then we'll finish off the series in just a couple of days. Christmas Eve service. We have two Christmas Eve services 4.30 and 6, and uh, candlelight service, traditional, we sing songs together, and uh, it's, it'll, it'll be really good. So certainly I hope that you're going to come and be part of that. But we're going to look at, like I said, the wise men, uh, and what made them wise? I mean, that's certainly a, a valid question. What's, what's up with them? I mean, you know, the wise men, right? I, I like, I think, to me, out of all of the people in, in, in the Christmas story, they're the most kind of interesting. Because first thing, like, we don't really know a whole lot about them, actually. I mean, I mean where, did they, where did they come from, right? I mean, they, we know they came from the east, and they were in the east of Jerusalem. They came from the east, so, but, you know, we don't really know a whole lot. M- most people think that they probably came from Persia, modern-day Iran. The Persians certainly... Uh, were into, you know, into, you know, there was Zoroastrianism, there was, they were into astrology and scientists. Now, the wise men certainly were, were, were uh, uh, knowledgeable, they were wealthy. We know some things about them just because how they would have traveled, uh, but they really could have been from India or even China. We don't, I mean, they, they traveled a long way, that's what we do know, following a star, and they went all the way to Jerusalem. Now, they weren't they weren't kings. I know some people say they're kings, they, but they were, they were wise. So they, they, they would have studied. They would have uh, uh, studied. Uh, we know they studied the Bible. Uh, even though they were far off, they studied the stars. And so they followed a star. But that was really common, actually. A lot of people would follow stars. This is a particular star, though, that led them all the way to Jerusalem. So we know that about them. We know that they they came a long way. They came from the east. Uh, they were they were they were wealthy. They, they you know, and and how many? Well, you know, a lot of times people think there was three, right? In our nativity set, we have three. Most nativity sets have three, but the Bible doesn't say that. I mean, there could have been more than three. There could have been ten or twelve or twenty or a caravan. We're not sure how many wise men came. I think the reason that there's often three, and people associate it with three, is because there's three gifts that were given, right? Three gifts. 
But that doesn't mean that there was only three of them. So those are some of the things that we know about the wise men. And, but the story is, is, is interesting. So let's read the story together, and then we'll kind of unpack it uh, and talk about uh, how, the, some important things that we can learn from it. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the time when Herod was king. So Bethlehem means house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. And uh, Herod, he's the king, but he's a puppet king. I mean, Caesar's the one who put him there. They hate him. They, he is, he is, uh, he's, he's a tyrant. He's personally afraid of being overthrown all the time. And so he, he, he killed his kids. He, 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 mur- he murdered his wife. He's a lot of his relatives. He, anybody who's a threat to him, he would just kill him. And so he's this puppet king, so, but he's, he's the, the, the king in that sense. When Jesus was born, some wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the baby who was born to be king of the Jews? Now, there's only one way they could have known this, to be able to ask this question, is if they had studied the Bible. They had studied the Old Testament. And they, kinda, they knew, hey, there's going to be a Messiah. There's going to be a Savior that's born. And then God guided them with this star. But they knew this amount. They knew this information because they were people who studied. It says, uh, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, obviously. You know, he's always troubled. And because he's troubled, everybody else is troubled, right? Because heads will roll when Herod's upset. And so that everybody is, is, is concerned. Herod called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the law and asked them where the Christ would be born. Because they were all expecting this. They knew it was written in the, in, in the Old Testament multiple times and prophesied. So he calls them together and they say, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they, they actually help him to know that. Now Herod is threatened by that. And so he uh, actually at some point brings a bunch of legions in and, and kills all the baby boys uh, in Bethlehem. But Jesus is not there at the time because G- Joseph is warned and he, and he goes to Egypt. So Jesus actually is raised in Egypt for a time. Then Herod had a secret meeting with the wise men and l- learned from them the exact time that they first saw the star. He sent the wise men to Bethlehem saying, look carefully for the child. When you find him, come to me, tell me so I can worship him too. So he's not interested in worship. He's wanting to kill them. As I said, the infamous massacre of the innocents happened uh, in, in Bethlehem. After the wise men heard the king, they left. The star they had seen in the east went before them until it stopped above the place where the child was. So the star uh, leads them to Jerusalem. Then they are equipped. Now Jesus is in Bethlehem, but the star leads them to Jerusalem. And so Jesus, uh, then the wise men are equipped with more knowledge of the Bible that evidently they were unaware of. And then the star, then, so, the, so, so Herod sends them to Jerusalem, but the star leads them directly to Jesus. I love that because it's like God's general will directs us and then we have God's specific will. And, and in, in the meantime, we're reading God's word. They, you know, they, had, they knew some of God's word and then they learned some more from from the priests that were in Jerusalem. When the wise men saw the star, they were filled with joy. They came to the house where the child was. Notice he's in a house now, not in a stable. A lot of times we, you know, the, the, I don't know if you know this, but the, the wise men never actually met the shepherds. I know in all of our manger scenes, they're always together, right? So they're like buds and they're friends, but actually they came at a different time. Doesn't mean you need to throw away your manger scene, okay? No, I'm not saying that. It, it makes for eventually they were all there, right? Okay, and they saw him with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. So they were there for that purpose. Then they opened their gifts and gave him treasures of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the question: So what made the wise men wise? That's what I want to ask. Okay. Well, there are some things, five things that we learn from the wise men that we see that's what made them wise. And if we want to be wise men, wise women, we want to have wisdom going into this new decade, this new year, we need to answer the same things. We need to respond the same way. First thing, they were seekers of truth. 
They were seekers of truth. Not everybody is a seeker of truth. But they, they really wanted to know the truth. And asking the truth, like, you know, questions like, uh, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What's, you know, what's up with my past? What about my future? I mean, important fundamental questions. And, and they were seekers of truth. So they're seeking after, uh, they're looking for the baby. It says, where's the baby who was born to be king of the Jews? They, they knew that amount of truth and they were seeking it. What is, how does this work? How does this all, you know, come about? And being a seeker of truth is, is a lot of it is a hard attitude. Saying, hey, I really want to know the truth. There's two kinds of people uh, in life when it comes to truth. One is, is speculators, and the others are seekers. Speculators, there's plenty of them around. They all have an opinion. Oh, I think God is like this. I think, I think in my mind, God should be like, well, it doesn't really matter what you think or what I think, right? I mean, I could think God is like a fuzzy bunny or Elvis reincarnated. Or the man in the moon. It just doesn't matter. It that doesn't make it true just because that's my speculation, my opinion. So there's lots of opinions and people with speculation. They just go circular reasoning over and over. They never land. They never make a decision. They love to debate. They love to argue. Speculators. They're just kind of always just having an opinion. Then they're seekers. They realize they don't know, but that's not acceptable. They want to pursue the truth. They want to really think, hey, how do I get to this place where I learn the truth? Genuine seekers will do four things. First thing, they ask questions. You know, they ask those important questions. And, 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 you know, like, what is the meaning of life? That's an important question. Why am I alive? What am I supposed to do with my life? And who is God? Then they study. And you... You research, you figure, hey, I want to I figure this out. Certainly the Bible is a great place to go. And you stay alert because God will sh- show us and direct us. Every time, all seekers, God is interested in them and interested in directing them to him. And so he will bring you a star. It might not be uh, a star like the wise men saw, but it'll be something that guides you. There's all kinds of things that will guide us to God. And then do whatever it takes to find the answers. Certainly the, uh, the wise men were willing to do that. I mean, that meant packing their bags. We're going on a trip. And it's going to be expensive. And I mean, they just, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes. In doing whatever it takes to find the truth. If you look for me, the Bible says, wholeheartedly, you will find me. See, God is interested in seekers. People that are looking for him. For years, our church, 25 years, our church has been considered a seeker-sensitive church. What that means is, is if you're wholeheartedly looking for God, you have doubts, you have questions, but you're wondering about these things, this is a great place for you. This is a place where people come and they try to figure that out. You don't just get caught up in speculation. You're saying, I'm, I'm seeking. I'm looking for some real answers. And we all are. And so we go and we look and we, and, we, and we seek. We're seekers of truth. Then they were willing to go any lengths to find it. Like I said, they're willing to, you know, here they are. They're in the east. We, we, they likely traveled for months, probably through the desert, in the heat. I mean, all kinds of tribulations, difficulties, trying to explain things, all of the things they had to leave behind, their businesses. And, but they're going to they're gonna do what it takes. It's not always easy. And so they're willing to go and we have to be willing to go any length. Now, this next, it, uh, we're going to launch this series this next year, this new decade, with this series called What's Next? And what we want to do is ask fundamental questions. You know, what am I supposed to do with my life? Where am I supposed to go? How am I supposed to get there? And we're going to look at God's Word, and we're gonna, we want to set a good foundation, answer some fu- fundamental questions for us. So certainly I hope that you're going to come and be part of it in the next steps for your next decade, and invite somebody to come and be part of it. That's where we're going. The Bible says, For we have seen his star in the far off eastern lands and have come to worship him. So they're doing whatever it takes. They're willing to travel and uh, make the sacrifice. You know, in those days, it was a big deal to travel like that. I mean, it would be comparable to kind of like going to Everest. 
You know, Everest, there's all this training, all this preparation. It's expensive to go to Everest. It's like sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. I mean, you, you got to have Sherpas to help you. I mean, it's a big deal to, to, to do that kind of expedition. This would be in the same league. I mean, we're going to travel. We don't even know how far. It's just a star leading us. But it doesn't matter. We're going. We're going. Then they didn't stop until they met Jesus. They didn't stop halfway. They, they didn't stop in Jerusalem. And they went all the way. The star, you know, stopped at Jerusalem. They paused. They asked more questions. They started going on that advice to Bethlehem. The star rose again and descended right there over Jesus. So, you know, they didn't stop. And for some of you, you've been seeking. You know, sometimes we just stop. You know, a lot of times in high school, we start asking those profound questions. Where am I going? What am I supposed to do with my life? Who is God? You know, what, 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 what's life all about? And maybe in our 20s, and then we get busy. We get into, you know, making money and a career, and we get involved in a relationship and kids, and next thing you know, we've stopped asking those questions. And that's sad. We should never stop asking those important questions until we have the answers. They didn't stop until they met Jesus. They came to the house where the child was. Then they came for the right reasons. I mean, that's important, coming for the right reason. You know, some people, they're they're only interested in using Jesus, not worshiping him. They just want to use him. You know, he's like a genie. You know, how do you rub the lamp? I I only want to know what I can get out of this deal. You know, so, you know, it's like a vending machine. You know, get, you know, where do I put the coin? I just want, you know, I just want my toy. I want my, my thing from God. That's, that's what I'm signing up for. And that's not the right reason. Certainly God loves to give us gifts, but that's not the reason. It says we have come to worship him. See, they came to adore him. They came to love him. A lot of people, they want to use God. They don't want to love God. And you see this all over. I mean, politicians will throw out God's name, throw out Jesus' name if they think it'll get them some more votes. You know, I mean, business people will do it if they think that it'll help them close a deal. You know, they'll, you know, put a little fish on their, on their logo or whatever. You know, they're, if, it, if it'll help me get some deals, that's, that's, all, that's all I'm interested in. Uh, the military will use Jesus, you know, to, to justify a war. I mean, there's lots of people that are, interested in using God, but they don't want to love God. And so this is, you know, see, this is what made the wise men wise. They, they understood attitude makes a big difference. And then they gave Jesus the best they had. The best they had. They came with gifts. They wanted to give God the best. They bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their gifts and gave him treasures. It was, it was valuable. It was special of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I heard of this preschooler. He misunderstood the whole Magi thing. He called them maggots. And he said, the maggots brought gold, Frankenstein, and Smurfs. But that's, <laughs> but that's from a preschooler's perspective, right? That's not. These gifts actually are very symbolic. Because gold is what, in times of ancient times, when you came and you visited a dignitary, a king, you brought a tribute, and it was a tribute of gold because it was the most valuable thing. It still is, really. It's one of the most valuable things, right? There was a time when platinum was higher, but it's gold again. I mean, gold is, this is extremely valuable. It's a treasure, and I'm going to give it. And then frankincense was... was uh, an incense that they burned in the temple. It was, a form, it was part of the worship of God. And so they're here, they're saying, you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You're, the, you're, you're God, you're worthy of worship. And this last thing, myrrh, which is kind of an odd gift to give at a baby shower. Because myrrh was a scent that they wrapped, when somebody died, they would wrap them in linen and cover it with this ointment that was scented with myrrh. And it meant you're going to die. That's kind of a weird gift to give at a baby shower, right? Your baby's going to die. But that's, Jesus came not to live but to die. He came to be a sacrifice. And so they recognize that he's the king of kings. He's God. He's worthy of worship. And he's our savior. He's going to die for us. And so these are symbolic. But they're, and they're saying, see, this is not just like, 
You know, a lot of times with a, a, we just go get a gift card, right? You know, that's not a lot of thought, a gift card. Here you go, gift card. Some, I know I'm ruining some of your gift, Christmas gifts. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but, but this is no gift card, right? This is like, I'm thinking about it. And this, this has special meaning. Here's some things that we can give God. Okay, first of all, I can give him my trust. You know, God doesn't have everything. Faith is volitional. You say, well, God, he has everything. Well, no, he doesn't. There's some things that only you can give him. You know, if, you, if, if I were to throw a birthday party for you and invite a million people, you'd go, dang, that's a serious birthday party. And then right at the time of the gift giving, I said, okay, everybody give their gifts to each other. And, and you didn't get any. You didn't even get one. That'd be kind of odd. That's Christmas, right? It's Jesus' birthday. And, and what gift do we give him? Some people say, my kids say, that, you know, Andy, you know, Dad, you know, you, you're hard to give to because you have, you know, you have everything you want and you don't want a whole lot. And, you know, maybe you're like that. You're, you're, it's hard to find a gift for you. What about God? He like, you'd say, well, he has everything. Well, no, there's some things he doesn't have. One of the things that he doesn't have unless you give it to him is your trust. I'm going to trust you. Going into 2020, I'm going to trust you with my life, with the things that are important to me. And only you can give that to him. Here's some things that you can trust him as you're setting your goals for, not just goals, but trust goals. God, I'm going to trust you with my health, with my marriage, with my relationships, with my heart, with my finances, career, mind. I'm going to trust you with all this stuff. And we just, God, I'm going to, I'm going to believe that you're going to be part of that. I'm not going to just do it on my own. According to your faith, Jesus said, it will be done unto you. You know what God's going to do in your life in 2020? Whatever you have faith for, whatever you expect him to do. If you don't expect God to move, you know what? You're going to go through this whole next year and you're not going to see God in any part of your life because you didn't expect it. So part of trusting God is saying, I'm going to believe, God, you're going to intervene. You're going to intersect my life. You're going to come and manifest yourself and make yourself a reality in my life. The Bible says, I want you to trust me in your times of trouble. And some of you are in times of trouble. And this is the time to trust him. So I can rescue you and I can give you my glory. Listen, God knows some of the things you're walking headlong into. Trouble. And he's going to let you go right there. Why? Well, part of it is it's in those places when we really reach out to him. And we trust him. And he's going to be there to rescue you. And you're going to discover he's, he's, he's faithful. And you can give him his, his, his due. The second thing that God doesn't have unless you give it to him is his first position in your life. He's saying, God, you are first place. You know, in the, in the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments is nothing should go before God. He should be first place in your life. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, you know, whenever we put something else in front of God, that's called an idol. That's what that is. You say, well, no, an idol is like a little carving. It can be that. But it's really anything that we put in front of God because God should be first place. He's got to be number one. And so going into 2020, realizing, hey, I want God as number one. Nothing else is going to be First place. You see, anything else you put there in first place, it can be taken away. You put your job or your career, number one, what happens if you lose your job? Your, your life falls apart. You put your bank account, number one, what happens when you go bankrupt? Your life falls apart. What about if you put a loved one in, in that place? What about if that loved one leaves or dies or whatever, and all of a sudden you come unglued? You, that's the center of your life, and that just falls apart. You implode. Nothing should be number one in your life except for God. It says, in everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. I love that because, you know, every time the Bible says, hey, you should do this, it always has a promise. There's a premise and then a promise, and here's no exception. He says, hey, if you put God first, what's going to happen? The things we look for things we want anyways. He goes, you know what? I'm going to direct you. I'm going to be there. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to be that. I'll send that star. And I'm going to crown your efforts. You're not going to just be spinning your wheels. I'm going to crown your efforts 
with success. Here's some things that you can do to put God first in your life. First, make sure he's first place in your finances. That's important because that's, that's important to us. Our finances say a lot about what we trust. And your interests, the things you're interested in. Uh, make sure he's first place there. Your relationships. Make sure he's first place in your relationships, in your, with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever. In your schedule. What, that means that each day you get up and you spend a little time with God. Even if it's only five minutes. And we all can carve out five minutes and don't devalue that. Five minutes can be, a, you know, the, 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 the devil would try to make you, ah, if you're only going to do five minutes, you will not, might as well not do any. That's not true. Five minutes, God can do a lot in five minutes. You just give him that. Say, hey, that's all I got. Okay, I'll work with that. And you give him five minutes. So each week, you give him a day, you know, like a Sunday. And in, in your finances, you give him a tithe. Put him first place there. And then each day, that's called your devotions. Where you, your quiet time, when you're, you, be, you spend a little time before God. You read a little bit of the Bible or something. And then your troubles. You just recognize, hey, God, in my troubles, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to go to you first. You know, often when, we're, when we have troubles, we get filled with anxiety, or we go talk to people. We have all kinds of coping mechanisms. What this means is you always go to God first. Hey, this is first, God's first place in my life, so he's, when I'm in trouble, I'm going to him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be given to you as well. So I give him my heart. That's another part. I give him my heart. God, I want to open up the things that are valuable to me. That's what it means. The things that, are, that mean the most to me. Open up my heart to him. It says, open up before God. Keep nothing back. He'll do whatever needs to be done. In other words, I need to, I need to have a place where uh, uh, there's, a, there's a close relationship between myself and God. It's not sterile. It's not, it's, it's not, he's not just thou. That's why when we sing songs... You don't, we don't really have a lot of thou's in our songs. It's, it's, we sing to God and we try to have very uh, endearing and intimate type of language because we want a close relationship. He's in our heart. We've invited him and you have a special place in my life. That's a big part of it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Jesus says, how do you know what's going on in your heart? And he goes, well, look at your treasure. What you put first place what, what, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And that's true. That's true. That's why part of what, when we give financially to God's work, it's putting our, it, our heart goes that direction as well. We place our treasure there. We're saying, God, I want you number one in that. And all of a sudden, our heart, we start thinking about it. You know, the, I, I don't really care how Boeing does, you know, the company that owns the planes and all. But if I were to buy some stock, I'd care. All of a sudden, I'm interested. I wonder how Boeing's doing. Never thought about it before. Now I'm interested. You go buy a car, all of a sudden, you're parking a little farther away. You don't want it dinged, you know? It's, yeah, I, why? Because that's where my treasure is. You see, when you put your treasure in something, it starts to, all of a sudden, you, your heart goes in that direction. And so that's, that's part of, now God doesn't need your money, right? He's, he, he has every, he's the one who created it. He, that, that money that you have, before you were born, it was his. After you were born, it's on loan to you. I mean, after you die, it's his. It's on loan to you. And so it's just a way of saying, God, your first place. It says God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I, I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. In other words, God says, I want what that money represents. I want you to know me. I want you to have a close relationship. And certainly our treasure leans us in that direction. If, you are, if you're a seeker, God has already provided a star for you. God wants to direct you. He wants to guide you. And, uh, and so he has a star for you. Now, I want to go to this last point. I will bring other people to Jesus. That's the, the, the last part. I want to bring, uh, in other words, that's something that God's trying to create a family. He loves people. And part of, there's a lot of people that are far from him. And part of the way that we, a, a gift we can bring God that he doesn't have this is when we bring somebody who's far from him. There's a lot of people that would be here, but they're just caught in their own, their own, they don't know the freedom that God offers. 
They don't know the joy that God offers. They don't know all of the, the power that God offers them to have the, a, a, a life that's filled with, with, with abundant life and, and life-giving relationships and, and the promises that are all connected to God, what God says. And, and so part, that's part of what we do. Certainly Christmas Eve would be one place. Uh, that new series, What's Next, you know, the, that, that's another place. But looking around, saying, hey, maybe, you know, because the truth is, for some of you, you're that star in somebody else's life. You're a star in somebody's life. What is a star? Well, a star can be uh, just somebody who's a devout Christian in the workplace, a neighbor who's interested, somebody, maybe even a family member, a relative. You know, even a problem can be a star. When we go through difficulties, it kind of, is God doing something? And, we, and, and we're that into somebody's life. For God so loved the world, Who's that? That's the world is, that's all the people that we know. That's us. And that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, that's his, that's the good news, but have everlasting life, eternal life. And that's the greatest gift. That's the greatest gift. You know, the whole idea of gift giving that we have at Christmas actually is rooted in the story we were looking at today. Because the wise men brought gifts. That's where it came from. It started there. They brought gifts. And I love that. You know, I know that there's the commercialization of gift giving, and there is. But you know, there's a truth to it. We don't have to get swept up into all of that. But gift giving is still at the heart of Christmas. God gave His one and only Son. He gave his son to be a sacrifice. And when we put our faith in him, that opens up more gifts. It's like a gift within a gift. Gifts of eternal life. Gifts of powerful living. Gift of being freed from our past. Of having a new future. Of being able to be used by God in a powerful way. I mean, there's a lot of gifts that come with that. But it all begins with this first gift of saying, I want the gift that God gave me, which is Jesus Christ. And that's really what Christmas is about. So let's bow our heads and we'll pray. So Lord, we just take a moment right now and invite you right here. We serve a living God. We study about all the things you've done in the past and we thank God for that. We thank you, Lord, for that. But you're alive today, right here, right now. Help us, Lord, to enter into the spirit of Christmas. Now, I want to bless you, and then I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I just pray a blessing over every person here, every person watching. You be with them. Lord, I pray for those people who are in dark places. Maybe you're not right now in a dark place, but... You live pretty continuously in a pretty low place emotionally. A, a place of not, not, there's not a lot of joy going on. There's a lot of pain. And so, Lord, I pray you fill their life. Bring comfort into their lives for those of you who are in that place. Those of you who are in a spiritual place that's a depression, a wilderness, a dry place. Lord, pour your Holy Spirit into their lives. Let them know you are near them. Send a star. Send people to come and support them in prayer and encouragement. Some of you are struggling with some wounds that have been said to you recently. People have said things that have hurt you and cut you deeply. And you've retracted, you've retreated. You're in a place of, of kind of defensiveness. And that's kind of overshadowing your life, overshadowing certainly the holidays. So Lord, I pray for healing. Lord, I pray that you give those who are in that place the ability to forgive and to let go. Not because they deserve it, but because that's not the way you want uh, them to live their lives in that place of defensiveness and in pain. Lord, I pray for this being a year of prosperity. Some of you have been in a financial hardship this last year and even beyond, and 
and you're saying, when is it going to end? And I'm just praying in Jesus' name, Lord, this would be the year it's going to end. It's going to change for you. God's going to open up the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing, pour out a, a material blessing and finances and favor with jobs and with projects and with, and with, with things you're working on and even dreams. Lord, I just pray for your favor to just be poured out. Lord, I pray that this is the decade of destiny. That we embrace our destiny once and for all. For some of you, this last decade has really just been a decade about yourself. You haven't really wrestled with these questions. Who am I? Where am I going? What is God's plan for my life? It's going to change. And so, Lord, I pray that you not only... uh, just show up in power, but all of those who are truth seekers, open up their minds, open up their hearts, give them direction. I want to invite you, if you've never put your faith in Christ or you're far from God, maybe you've sought along the way, but you've stopped short. You didn't go all the way. And you have not met God personally through Christ. Then I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. Whether you're online or you're here in the service, would you just just honestly, just right before God, just say this prayer. Say, God, today I want to come to know you. I put my faith in Christ today. And I expect big things. I expect to see you move in my life. Help me to walk out forgiveness. Help me to experience the joy that comes with serving you. Help me to discover my purpose. You say, God, forgive me for trying to do things on my own. I don't want to do that anymore. And so in your power, I'm going to start to step one step at a time in the direction of putting you first and trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen.